San Bonan. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Professor Deborah Mayer, Executive Dean of the Faculty of Science. Professor Omotayo Arutiba, who is going to be inducted today. Arutiba means uh, the one who stays <laughs> with the father. In Venda, it means the one who lets go and close. I don't know what you are going to close. <laughs> Professor Emmanuel Iwu Oha, who is going to respond. He came all the way from uh, the University of Western Cape. Senior leaders of the university, um, the executive dean uh, and, uh, and her team, members of Senate and other academics, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It is indeed a great honor and special privilege for me to welcome you to the professorial inaugural lecture of Professor Arutiba. As I do so, I wish to express a warm welcome to his, beloved, to his loved ones, special guests and colleagues. This is indeed a proud and joyful, yet a landmark moment for all of you, for Professor Arutiba, and of course for us here at UJ and higher education in South Africa and beyond. The inauguration of professors is a public ceremony in which newly appointed professors are inducted into office by the Vice Chancellor and deliver their inaugural addresses. The ceremony has its roots in the medieval university and serves multiple purposes. Firstly, it is an expression of welcome and entry to new professors joining the circle of colleagues who are already professors. Secondly, it provides a platform for the professors to display their expertise in the discipline and showcase their research. Tonight, we are going to be listening to the inaugural address but by Professor Ayrutiba. Once we have listened to the inaugural address, the gown uh, denoting the professorship will be formally assumed. It is a celebration of the contributions to the discipline and ultimately the impact on society. Professors provide a university with its identity, character, and academic legitimacy and integrity. The inaugural lecture is a rite of passage following the confirmation of the appointment of a person as a professor. This evening, we will listen to Professor Arutiba as the gown goes down to town. By this, I mean that the power of the inaugural address is when the expertise is, sh is showcased beyond the corridors of the university and reverberate with society. It, of course, stands out as a moment of pride uh, for the incumbent, for the family, for the fellow scholars, and for us as the University of Johannesburg, and ultimately to society. For the German philosopher and diplomat Humboldt, a university is referred to the whole community of scholars, and students engaged in a common search for truth. Newman talked about teaching universal knowledge. Recently, universities have been viewed as instrumentalist serving the purpose of the economy or utilitarian in purpose. I would hope that we can break out of these narrow conceptualizations and reflect on the university as contributing to public good. Edward Said, in an article on defiance and taking positions, offers a formulation of the ideal role of the true intellectual as one who commands vast knowledge 
of his or her discipline, who is rigorous in the analysis of literature, who views being an intellectual as a vocation, the intellectual who considers it necessary to step into the public sphere and to speak truth to power, namely to question, interpret, and understand authority rather than consolidating it, to step out of the boundaries of the academy, to connect oneself, to affiliate oneself, to align oneself with an ongoing process or contest of some sort, perhaps with the aim of improving the lot of the oppressed. The intellectual who functions as a kind of public memory to recall what is forgotten or ignored, to make the connections that are otherwise hidden, and to provide alternatives for mistaken policies." Close quote. It remains then for us as a university with a Pan-African vision to derive our mandate as intellectuals and as professors. How do we embrace the role of a professor as a disruptor while continuing to be flagship carriers of our disciplines? This evening, we listen to Professor Arotiba as one further step in the journey of being a professor. This is a journey which does not culminate once this lecture has been given. It is a self-reflective pause in the journey of the professor with a promise of more to enrich our minds and simultaneously contributing to the rich intellectual body of work in the discipline. I have been following the work of Professor Arutiba. In fact, before I came to this lecture, I have been studying a little bit of chemistry. <laughs> I spent time trying to recall uh, nuclear physics and chemistry. And I think uh, this month, which is Women's Month, I am reminded of Marie Curie, who went through extraordinarily difficult uh, 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 journey to become a physicist. In her home country, Poland, she was not allowed to study. She left Poland and she went to um, France. And when uh, a Nobel Prize was, uh, was about to be announced in 1903, she was excluded. They included her husband. And by the way, she was much smarter than her husband. <laughs> it was only when her husband uh, said he was going to refuse this honor if his wife is not included, because he simply does not deserve it more than she, she, she did, that they decided to give both of them the Nobel Prize. Of course, she became the first woman to win a Nobel Prize. And even up to today, she remains the only woman to win. To, uh, she remains the only person, not just the only woman, the only person to win two Nobel Prizes in two different science fields, one in chemistry, one in physics. So I was going, uh, uh, trying to understand, especially given the, the journey or the visit by Vladimir Putin who was asking about uh, South Africa and its nuclear ambitions. So I was trying to recall, uh, what is this thing about uh, nuclear energy? Where does the energy come from? So I was reminded of the protons and the electrons and the neutrons. And also the fact that uh, it's called nuclear energy because it comes from the nucleus. It's the protons and the neutrons that are inside the, the, the nucleus. I was also reminded of uh, the fact that uh, if you have too many uh, uh, protons uh, in the nucleus, then the electromagnetic forces are simply too, too much for the nuclear forces. And that is why you have radioactivity. So let me now invite the Executive Dean, Professor Deborah Meyer, to introduce Professor Omodayo Arotiba so that we can listen to his uh, very important teaching to us. Thank you very much. Kialibua, Sia Wonga, Bayadanki.
Good evening. So it's my privilege to introduce uh, Professor Arotiba to you to, uh, this evening. Omateo Ademola Arotiba was born in Nigeria into the family of Chief David Omateo Arotiba and Mrs. Margaret Bamidele Arotiba. He completed primary and secondary education at Bodija International School, Ibadan, and St. Peter's Unity, Unity Secondary School, Akure, respectively. He completed his BSc Honours and MSc in Industrial Chemistry at the University of Iloran and University of Benin, both in Nigeria. And he completed a PhD in Physical Chemistry um, at the Department of Chemistry at the University of the Western Cape in South Africa under the supervision of Professor Emmanuel Ourua and Professor Priscilla Baker. After completing his PhD in 2008, he was involved in postdoctoral research at Sensor Lab and also at the Department of Chemical Engineering, University of Cape Town, and at the University of Johannesburg. He joined the Department of Applied Chemistry at this university in 2011, where he is now a full professor, and we are going to get an opportunity to judge that for ourselves in a few minutes. <laughs> Prof, uh, Professor Rutiba is the director of the Center for Nanomaterial Science Research and also the current chairman of the Electrochemistry Division of the South African Chemical Institute. He received the Royal Society of Chemistry Young Chemist Award in 2009 and he is a C1 rated researcher with the National Research Foundation of South Africa. He is a member of the International Society of Electrochemistry the Royal Society of Chemistry UK, and the South African Chemical Institute. He has published 81 papers in journals of international repute from 2007 until 2018. And he has graduated up to this point nine PhDs and 12 MSc students. Professor Aritiba loves teaching, motivating, mentoring, and pastoring. He is a strong believer in exceptional leadership, He's passion in this life is to inspire others towards excellence. He has a heart for young people and is thus heavily involved in UJ student life and other community development um, projects. Omateo is a missionary with the men of Issachar vision and he is married to, married to Adiola and they are blessed with th three children, he says at the moment. Um, <laughs> So I should perhaps just warn the lady of the house. <laughs> but we also want to then welcome and acknowledge Zion, Shalom, and Israel. So now it's my opportunity to welcome Professor Rutiba to uh, demonstrate to us his skills in chemistry. Good evening, um, my Vice Chancellor, the Dean, Professor Iwoa, all professors seated, all head of departments, um, all invited guests, all protocols duly really observed. Remember, there's no module in chemistry that talk about this type of protocol, but I read a lot and I think I got it right this time. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Mayer, for the very kind introduction. I am here to present my talk <coughs> titled Sense It, Treat It, Electrochemistry in Action. Uh, as we know that um, in most talks, uh, they always end with appreciation or vote of thanks. But in my case, I would prefer to start with gratitude. As you can see, there are some quotes I have on the screen. It says, gratitude is when memory is stored in the heart and not in the mind. Feeling gratitude and not expressing it is like wrapping a present and not giving it. I want to take this time because to me this is very important to say thank you to all those who have added value to my life in one way or the other. Uh, the first group of people I'd like to acknowledge are the vehicles that brought me to this world. My parents, uh, 
or if my father is not feeling so well, he would have loved to be here. He's a retired academic himself, uh, but I know that he's very happy today. And that is my beautiful mother, Mrs. Bamindele Margaret Arotiba. I also like to acknowledge my wife. Uh, you can see love all around. Uh, yeah, you can smell love in the air. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, if you, I believe you, you will read my, uh, the booklet. I talked a lot about her. We did PhD together. She understands publication. She understands rejection of papers. She, we cry, we used to dance together when people get accepted. She even knows impact factor. She knows publication unit. And we gossip the dean a lot with all this publication <laughs> unit. And so she knows the drill. And it's always interesting when your wife is with you when you are nobody. Because when you are now somebody, she understands the responsibility. So thank you to my dear wife, Adeola. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. I will have added more spaces, but I think I ran out of space. <laughs> so I have to just leave it that way. And um, it is a dream of every researcher to publish in Nature. And uh, in my little career, I've published three papers in Nature. <laughs> the first, my first publication is Zion. My second publication is Shalom. And my third paper is Israel. And you know, if you do this without acknowledging the co-author, that's going to be an issue. So I have to acknowledge the co-author. Uh, I don't know, but we published together. Okay, and uh, I believe we are above 18, we understand. So this is my lovely family, and I'm glad that they are all here with me tonight. And uh, I also want to acknowledge my younger brothers. I come from a family of all boys, and uh, that is me, Tunde Benga Muiwa, and uh, this is our adopted brother. We even adopted a boy again. So it's just boys and boys all through. Okay, I'd like to acknowledge this very special set of people. My supervisor, Professor Emmanuel Iwoha, and I'm glad he's here today. My co-supervisor, Professor Priscilla Baker. Now, I decided to write all their names in full so that you will know that I know them. Okay, I didn't pick it from the internet. <laughs> so I know them so well and uh, supervised me in University of, uh, University of Western Cape in Sensor Lab, and they are still part of my life till today. Thank you very much. And of course, Professor Becky Mamba, he told me that it's also uh, in another inaugural in UNISA. He would have loved to be here. Uh, Professor Mamba was my host when I was here as a postdoctoral fellow. At one time, he was my HOD. At one time, he was my dean. And I'm very grateful for the role he has played in my academic career. And of course, my friend here, Professor Frank Marken, who is my academic mentor, is a very interesting fellow. Uh, there are times I just travel to the UK, and I'll just be with him for three, four days. We just drink tea. And, uh, and I learned a lot from him. If you check his profile, you will know that he's somebody that you need to associate with. OK, I have to thank the group. I normally call them the group. It's Women's Month, and I'm surrounded by women. So this is our, these are my team in the research group. My mentees, Dr. Mabuba, Dr. Nkosi, Dr. Makakato. They are part of my life in the laboratory. We've been together for quite a long time. I have to say thank you. Uh, you made my life tough, I guess. And you made my life sweet, both sides. And so thank you for that. But you know, you can just imagine working with three women. It's a lot of work. You need to be smart. You need to pretend. You know, there are many things you need to do to balance. But that is not all. While I'm still trying to sort out these three women, another one shows up, my HOD. <laughs> and uh, while I'm still trying to figure out, another one shows up, <laughs> my deed. So you see, now you understand why I have white hair. <laughs> because of all the people I'm surrounded with. Now, this white hair is not old age. Some people used to make the mistake. It's wisdom. It's not old age, OK? I also want to thank this very special set of people. I don't know. I know Professor Olua Femi is in the house. He's my friend. He's my brother. He's my colleague. I don't want to tell so much about him, so there won't be conflict of interest when the dean is trying to send us for conference or give us money. But I won't think it's the same port. Uh, we are different ports. 
was a wonderful brother of mine with his wife, and they are all here. Another friend of the family, Dr. Ken Diojifini and his wife. I don't know if they are okay. Oh, all right, they are there, the member of my family. I also want to acknowledge, if you read in my bio, that I'm a missionary, and I also want to acknowledge all my church members who are here today. Thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge the best department in Africa. <laughs> Department of Applied Chemistry. Yeah, this is the best team you can ever have. This is a team that we fight, and after the fight, we erase all the errors, and it's as if we never fought. It's a very wonderful team, and uh, we look forward to working together, because now we are bigger by virtue of the merger. I'd like to thank the University of Johannesburg for giving me a job, and for paying me my salary. <laughs> <laughs> All my students, past and present, thank you very much. There's no professor without a student. I also want to thank all my funders, uh, NRF, Mintech, Water Research Commission, ESCOM, Center for Animal Material Science, and of course, University of Johannesburg. All my collaborators in Singapore, Italy, France, and thanks to all of you who are here. Thank you very much. And um, the ultimate gratitude goes to, I know you can't see him, but he's here, God. I want to thank God for what he has done in my life and how he has brought me this far. Okay, uh, my research philosophy is written in the, in the booklet. I won't go because of time, but two things I always like to say. I see myself as an awakener. I see myself as a mentor. I believe in growing people. I believe in adding value to people's lives. Let me quickly unpack what I'm here to talk about today. My research is in the area of electrochemistry, in the area of electrochemistry, analytical electrochemistry, photoelectrochemistry, physical chemistry, and also electrochemistry of materials. So when I say sense it, sense it covers all my research in the areas of sensors and biosensors. When I say treat it, it covers all my research in the area of electrochemical technology for water treatment. And this dot, dot, dot means and others, okay? Uh, there are many things you do. Government gives you fun, you do this, and you use the other one to do this. You have some eating passions here and there. So these are, are some of the things I do outside these senses and treat it. Electrochemistry is a very interesting uh, science, and it's defined as the branch of chemistry that deals with the changes produced by electricity and the production of electricity by chemical reaction. There's no way you can talk about electrochemistry without mentioning some of these great people, just to acknowledge what they have done to sciences. Volta, the battery, and of course, Humphrey Davry was able to tell us the relationship between chemical reaction and production of current. And my favorite, Faraday, uh, maybe because he was a pastor, but Faraday was one of the most brilliant scientists, if you read his story, and invented a lot of stuff. And Faraday's law of electrolysis is still what we are using till today. The following slide is just to show you briefly the relevance of electrochemistry. Electrochemistry is used a lot now in the world of forensic. In this paper, forensic study to determine the amount of lead uh, in gunshot residue. This paper is highlighting how you can use electrochemistry to detect this drug called rofinol. Now, this rofinol is 10 times more potent than valium. So people who do this sex issue, they just give you a drink, they just drop it, you drink, and you sleep, and by the time you wake up, you've been assaulted. That's the drug they use, and we, electrochemistry can be used to detect this. And also, electrochemistry is also good for warfare and biological safety. Electrochemistry can be used in the agriculture. This is one of our papers uh, when I was in the sensor lab to detect aflatoxin B, which is toxin, uh, in food. And electrochemistry is the science behind corrosion prevention of corrosion. A lot of uh, mechanical engineers have been in my lab to study some parts of their corros corrosion. Electrochemistry also is used in battery. We all know about battery. Electrochemistry is used in supercapacitors. Uh, I just put the difference there uh, in terms of energy density and power density. I don't have time to explain that. Electrochemistry is used in fuel cell. And I know today there are some cars now that are driving with these batteries. It's a product of electrochemistry. Electrochemistry is also used to treat water and at the same time produce electricity, which is also what we call um, microbial fuel cell. 
Electrochemistry is used in water treatment. These are some of the plants that are actually now getting into market. Another interesting thing that electrochemistry does is solar, uh, solar cell. And actually, this is Grazel. I've been to this place uh, personally. It's a beautiful place where they generate electricity from solar cell. So let's go to the first part of my work, which is sensing it. I'm talk going to talk about biosensors, aptama biosensors, DNA biosensors, biosensors based on supramolecular platform. How do we define biosensors? The first thing we need to understand the philosophy of biosensors. Biosensors has to do with looking into what nature does. We have all seen over the years that DNA, enzymes, and antibodies, they are very, very efficient machines. And they have excellent bioreactivity. They have excellent bioselectivity. So what we do in biosensors is just to copy these biomolecules to see how they behave in the body and try to replicate it outside the body. So it follows the saying that if you can't beat them, you better join them. That's what we do in biosensors. Another philosophy of biosensors is simplicity. If it is too rigorous, if it is too demanding, then we better call it another name. So we are thinking of moving from something like this to something like that. So how do we define biosensors? I'll just use this cartoon to explain what biosensor is. A biosensor is an analytical device that incorporates a bioreceptor. The bioreceptor can be DNA, it can be enzyme, it can be bacteria. And this bioreceptor is integrated into or is immobilized onto a transducer surface. Now, most of the time, that transducer surface can have a lining of some materials, which can <coughs> be a polymer. Now, this transducer can be in many forms, but usually in form of electrode. And this transducer, in close proximity with the bioreceptor, forms what we call the biosensors. So, in the presence of an analyte, which can be cocaine or anything, there will be a kind of a bio recognition reaction, which will now give us signals that we can measure in form of light or current. That is what a biosensor is. And historically, uh, people agree that uh, the father of biosensor is Professor Clark, who was the first person to start the issue of glucose biosensor. To date, glucose biosensor used by diabetics and used by people who want to test their glucose is the most successful biosensor in the market to date. And the chemistry is very simple. That strip that we have in our hand, the strip there, it's just when your blood comes in contact with the strip, the strip has an enzyme immobilized on it, and there will be a reaction between the enzyme and the glucose in your blood to produce hydrogen peroxide and gluconic acids. Mm -hmm. So this hydrogen peroxide is electroactive, and there's a battery that is inside here. So the battery oxidizes the hydrogen peroxide. The current produced is directly proportional to the amount of glucose that you have in your blood. Very, very simple. And the idea of, of biosensor is you don't need to go to school. Most of the nurses that do this test in the clinic have no idea of what the chemistry is. All they just need is to have the readout, and that is the essence of biosensors. So there are challenges in this area of research, and it has to do with sensitivity, biocompatibility. In order to solve this problem, you need to have understanding of the immobilization chemistry. How do you put this material? Remember, you have taken them out of their comfort zone. They are no more in the body. Now they are on the electrical surface. So you need to see how you can make them comfortable in a new environment. To do that, you must understand a lot about material chemistry. You must understand supramolecular chemistry and supramolecular architecture. So I want to quickly go through what I have contributed to this field. The first thing, and the, one of the main things I've contributed to this field is the use of this material called dendrima. And uh, remember, we talk about biomimicry. So dendrima itself has an architecture that looks like nature. If you look at these trees, you will see that there's a dendritic architecture already. If you look at the alveoli in the lungs, a dendritic architecture. So in terms of the design, it looks like something that nature will identify with. And if you compare dendrima with DNA, they have a lot in common, as I've highlighted there because of my time. So dendrima is very suitable for biomimicry because of the relationship it has with all these biomolecules. And a lot of work has been done on dendrima. The chemistry of dendrima actually permits what we call host guest chemistry, permits what we call self-assembly chemistry, self-organization chemistry. Remember, I'm talking about biosensors. We have to think of the chemistry that the body loves. And the chemistry that the body loves is supramolecular chemistry. The double-strand DNA is, has come together because of supramolecular chemistry. This virus I'm showing here 
is a build-up of supermolecular chemistry. Supermolecular chemistry is simply the chemistry of nature. And there are a lot of things we can do with dendrimas in terms of building them up to be a supramolecular architecture. So what do we do? Uh, in my research, what we do, we use dendrima in this following ways. Number one, we use dendrima to act as a molecular house. We entrap the biomolecule inside the voids of the dendrima. The second thing we do, this is our electrode, this is dendrima, that's a nanoparticle, and that is an enzyme. So what we do is that we can also use dendrima nanocomposite as a redox mediator. That is an agent that can shuttle electron from the enzyme to the electrode surface. Then we can also use the nanoparticle to form what we call molecular wiring because the redox center of this enzyme is hidden somewhere inside. So we need the nanomaterial that can penetrate into the enzyme to make contact with the redox center and transport electron to the electrode surface. And fourthly, we can use dendrima nanocomposite to amplify our signal. Okay. Now, this chemistry, this whole idea was conceived in Professor Emmanuel's lab when I was doing my PhD. This is a very old chemistry where we can put an aminobenzoic acid onto a glassic carbon electrode. Now, this chemistry motivated me into thinking that it's possible that we can do the same for dendrima because we have a free amine group somewhere. And we're able to do that successfully. And we publish a lot of papers in this area where we are able to now uh, conjugate this material to the glassy carbon. And I must say that we happen to be the first uh, people that would do this type of research. And we've done a lot of characterization of different generations of dendrima and some of the pictures I'm showing there. So what uh, I've contributed to this field is the use of dendrima as a platform for DNA biosensors. Now, when you see DNA biosensors, there are many things we look at. Sometimes we put a single strand on the, on the little surface. We want it to, comp to have hybridization with the complementary strand. So I just want to use this cartoon. And this is, an, this is what we call impedance spectroscopy. And what happens is that when there is hybridization, the double-stranded DNA forms a, a high negative charge. So the negative density of this electrode will begin to increase. So when DNA binds with another DNA, the electron charge increases, and it will begin to repel the electrolyte in solution, and the more the repulsion, the larger the semi cycle, and the larger the diameter. You have more DNA, you see more repulsion. So that is how we measure the extent of hybridization. We also have what we call aptamers, where we now have this DNA that binds to a certain molecule. Because of the binding, there is a kind of a disruption on the electrode surface, and we can use that disruption or dielectrics to do a lot of measurement. We can also measure electrocatalytic current that comes from the enzyme. So just want to highlight some few things we've done. My first paper, I always believe in the first. The first is very important. I remember when I published this paper, I was dancing all around. Uh, first of Priscilla, remember? Uh, this was our first paper in the area of biosensors. And of course, we were the first to use methylodendrima. And uh, the story is a long story. This paper has a lot of stories. But I'll just say one thing I remembered. Um, my supervisor believes that you cannot say that you have nothing to do. So when I came in to do my work was actually on hydrogel. But we're waiting for all these chemicals and said, no, just try something else. So we tried methylodendrima. So we have a student, a colleague, Rehana Mahas from Professor Mapoli's lab, working on this material for olefin catalysis. So I tried the material for biosensors and it worked. Now I wanted to continue my work, but remember I was PhD, Mahas was master. So she was not in a hurry like me. So I started waiting for her to give me more of these compounds. And she would tell me, no, I'm, I'm not done with the synthesis. It's difficult to purify. That's why I don't do synthesis. You always purify something. So <laughs> at the end of the day, I just told myself, you know what? Let me look into my results again. Look at this result. I observed here that there are two peaks in this DPV. In these two peaks, one of them was due to the dendrima. One of them was due to the metal center. Now, all what this lady did was to put metal into the dendrima. That means without the metal, I can still see some level of electroactivity. So I just dumped the whole idea of metallodendrima and looked straight into the dendrima because the more natural, the better. So I discovered that that works, and that is why you could see this peak at 200 millivolts. And we published our second paper in that area where we are able now to use dendrima, not the metallodendrima, to be able to produce a biosensor. So from there, we started working on this area, and you will see me using us and we 
because uh, I cannot claim that I'm the only one who does this, but of course, uh, it's just my way of saying it's a togetherness uh, of a kind in my research. So, we published this paper also on the physical chemistry of dendrimas. It's one of my favorite papers. So when I came to UJ, I started working now on dendrimas for enzymes. Because remember, dendrima has proven, if dendrima is compatible with DNA, obviously it's compatible with enzymes. So we published some work in this area where we're able to use dendrima to detect urea in samples. Now, uh, my trip to CSIR, I got to meet uh, Professor Cathy, or Dr. Cathy. Uh, he was telling me about something called aptamas to cure HIV. And I said, okay, if aptamas can bind to the virus GP120 in the body, obviously it can bind outside the body. So what I did was I now took his, GP, his aptamas and were able to form a biosensor that can detect HIV virus. Uh, the, the wall of the virus is as a protein called GP120. So the whole idea is this aptama can bind to that protein. So we did a preliminary study and were able to get a very good result and the work has been has, it's already published, and of course, mm -hmm. I've gotten, I got a lot of media attention by virtue of that biosensor, because the principle is we can detect the virus directly, not the antibody. If this is successful, then there's no need for this window period anymore. Okay. So, just a little cartoon of what we do. So we put the dendrima on the electrode surface by CN, uh, bonding, then streptavidine, and dendrima. This is supramolecular chemistry. Dendrima is positive, cetavidine is anionic. So there's an electrostatic attraction between the two of them. And now all we just need to do is to biotinylate the biomolecule. Biochemists here will know there's a strong bond, strong natural <laughs> bond between biotin and cetavidine, supramolecular again. So when they come together, the DNA is properly anchored on the electrode and it can be used to now detect the GP120, which is the protein in the wall. And we are sending this study again for enzymes, dendrima on the electro surface. We now use carbodimide chemistry because of the peripheral amino group to bind to this carboxylic group on that is capping the quantum dots. And now supramolecular chemistry again between the enzyme and the, and the MPA capped quantum dots. And we can use it to detect things like cholesterol. This is one of the work we are about to publish. So these are just some of the work we have done in this area. And the exact thing we are doing now, we are looking at supramolecular chemistry. It's one of our recent work in biochemistry, and we have used this principle to detect some biomarkers. One of them is called alpha photoprotein, which is a cancer biomarker. So where are we going with this research? We are looking into more understanding of the supramolecular chemistry between the dendrima and the biomolecule. Quickly, let me go to sensors. Uh, in sensors, what we do is we sense. Now, the difference between sensor and biosensor is just that for a chemical sensor, we don't need a biomaterial. So one of the very popular techniques is stripping, where we immobilize, or let me say deposit now. We deposit a metal by, oxid by oxidation, by reduction. Then when we reduce, we now oxidize again, and we measure the current. So you can use this method to detect a lot of metals in solution. So what is my contribution? My major contribution in this area is the use of another type of material called exfoliated graphite. Now, let me just take you this. We all know Scopus, the Lagrange database is Scopus. If you search electrochemical sensor and exfoliated graphite, you will see a lot of papers. But if you look at, if you analyze the result, the top 10 researchers globally in this area, you will see my name there. Okay? So when it comes to exfoliated graphite for electrochemical sensors, we are global leaders in this area. And of course, if my name is number one, University of Johannesburg is also number one in this area of research. Okay. Thank you. Then, what we did was, since the most popular electrode in the carbon world is glassy carbon electrode, so we compared this exfoliated graphite with glassy carbon electrode, and we could see that in many cases, it's even performed better than the glassy carbon electrode. So that became a platform for our sensing. And one of the metals that we sense was arsenic. We've done a lot of work on, on arsenic because it's very important. South Africa is into mining. We need to begin to watch arsenic. Again, if you check Scopus, you type electrochemical, sensor, and arsenic, you will see again that we are global leaders in this area. And uh, we publish a lot of work in these areas. That is my name. Dr. Mabuba is here. 
Idris is here. I know he doesn't know how important he is. But um, <laughs> so a lot of, a lot in this area, we are global leaders. And again, University of Johannesburg. ESCOM has been talking to us about this census because they really want to be using it now. And we hope something good will come out of that. And we have used this approach to detect three metals at the same time. We've detected lead, arsenic, and mercury at the same time, even in real water sample. Okay, so what is this exfoliated graphite? Very simple electro. We take a very cheap graphite, we intercalate it with acid. After intercalation, we put it in microwave or we put it in heater. We bust it open like popcorn, and the layers we just tear off. And when the layers tear off, we decompress it again at high pressure, and we form a flat sheet of electrode, something like this. And this is how it looks like. A glassy carbon electrode is 5,000 rand, exclusive VAT. And uh, this homemade exfoliated graphite is less than 500 rand. And the whole idea of electrochemistry is to move into cheaper ways of doing things. And we've done a lot of work in this area. I would like to quickly point to this. When you are doing arsenic biosensors or arsenic sensing, the major challenge is copper. Copper is always an interference. So what we did in this work was that we now use a complexometric approach to solve the problem of copper. So by putting a ligand into the solution, the ligand can complex the copper, then you have the arsenic that is free. So here is the arsenic alone. When you add copper, the current increases. So you would think the current is due to arsenic. No, it's because of copper. When you add the ligand, you are able to separate both of them, and now you can detect. It's a very simple approach. And we published this work in one of the best journals in electrochemistry, which is electrochemistry communication. And from there on, we've done a lot of work on mercury, on we've used diamond to detect chlorophenol. And where are we going in this area of research? The dream is given in pictures. We have this type of, this is a potential stat, very small, and we want to take it to the field, test arsenic in water, and give information to the rural community. So this is a biosensor. This is, I'm sorry, this is an electrochemical workstation. So this, as small as this, is able to do all this chemistry I'm talking about. Okay. And lastly, in the area of treating it, in the area of water, this is one passion I developed in the University of Johannesburg, and we have been doing a lot of work in water treatment. So we know uh, there's this issue of dye industry. The industries, the dye industry, they are trying to make a molecule that will stick strongly to your cloth and will not wear off after many washes. The water treatment people, we want something that is easy to break down. So as we are looking for ways of breaking down dyes, the synthetic chemists, they are looking for ways of producing more stubborn ones that cannot be broken down. So that is, the, that is what is going on. And now all our water treatment system have been designed to only solve the problem of normal pollutants. There are some very stubborn pollutants that are very difficult to remove. So based on all these challenges, we find that our water treatment plant, we are loading with more and more coagulants, more and more chemicals. We are having more sludges over and over. So how do we solve this problem? We need to begin to look at other approaches, and that is our area of research. Uh, I don't want to bore you with most of this chemistry, but for electrochemical technology, we generate hydroxy radical at the electro surface. The challenge is many of you must, maybe you've heard of photocatalysis. When you do photocatalysis, the main problem there is the issue of electron hole combination. So when you excite your semiconductor, it can recombine again, and you lose the potency of the semiconductor. So another, is, another problem is, because of the large band gap, you may not be able to use normal or solar light to excite your semiconductor. You have to use UV, which is not practical. So that is what we do in this area of research. We are using electrochemistry and nanotechnology to solve this problem. Okay. So electrochemical technology is energy efficient, low cost, depending on uh, how you see it, one size fits all, easy to automate, and has very friendly requirement. So what have we done in this area? Synthesis, we've used accelerated graphite again to produce anodes. We've had a lot of solar responsive semiconductor analog analogs. We've done a lot of electrodes based on mixed carbon. Sorry. Now we are looking at heterojunctions of semiconductors just to prevent this problem of recombination. We, we are designing nano-hybrids and hybrid electrodes for electrocoagulation. And we are looking at new types of um, material, new types of system called diodes that I'm going to just mention later on toward the stagnation of water. Okay, so again, if you look at, if you look at water treatment, you search couples, water treatment and filtered graphite, you will see again, you'll see like 70 documents it's not, it's a new area of research. 
And again, this is this is my name, I guess. Yes, that's my name. <laughs> this is Dr. Pele Yaju here, Professor uh, Mamba, Sampath. This is also my PhD student, a former PhD student. We are again the global leader in this area of research. And I'll show you our recent review because for you to be allowed to write a critical review, especially in RSC journals, you must have been uh, uh, known as an authority in the field. So what do we do? Uh, we use different types of material together to try and tune this material so that they can absorb light in the solar region. Look at zinc oxide. Um, here we have a zinc oxide here. The solar region is between 450 to 800, and you will see that the absorbance is very low. Not with UV, but with white light, with sun. Now, when you now put accelerated graphite, it acts as an electron sink, and now you could see that the absorbance has increased in the solar region. When you do it with palladium, you have increased the absorbance again. So we do a lot <coughs> of band gap tuning, and what we have here it's just the measurement of photocurrent. You put on the light, the current goes up. You put off the light, the current comes down. It's a way of trying to see whether this photo anode is responsive to sunlight. And we've done a lot of work. My first student in this area uh, is Dr. Bulerwa and Sendwana, and, and I believe she happens to be the first PhD student in this area in South Africa. We did this work, and were able to degrade nitrophenol in water. We compared it with the classical method of the photocatalysis, and into chemical organization, and we got better results. So we went ahead to remove trichloroethylene, and we used diamond to remove this dye in water. And we've done a lot of work in this area where we degrade different types of pollutants in water. Recently also, we looked at having zinc oxide, which reduced graphene oxide, to remove orange 2 dye in water. And uh, there's one I really want to highlight, this one. When you do this area of research, one of the challenge we have is we do not know the degradation products. You are just breaking down this heavy molecule. You are not sure whether you are creating some smaller, more poisonous molecule. So now, the, 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 the people in this area of research, we are concerned about what exactly are the products that you are breaking down. In order to do that, you need to be very good at LCMS. And uh, <coughs> anything chromatography is not my strength. So as was what professors do, what my professor did to me. He just said, go and do it, okay? So I put my student, go and do the LCMS, and we've been getting some good results, but we just felt, is there another approach that we can use? And that other approach is using computational chemistry to predict the degradation breakdowns in this material. So it's one of our recent work in RSC advances. Okay, we have a dream <coughs> to also do desalination, and this is the work of Lutando, where we are developing ionic diodes. Ionic diodes work like the diodes in the physics, but here we are trying to modulate ion transport. So we believe that we'll get to a point where we're able to remove salt from water using this technique, and we have been able to publish a paper in this area when uh, Lutando was in UK with my mentor. And this is another fascinating work we are doing now in the lab, electrocoagulation. And this is just a setup. And because we want to go to prototype, and I just discovered that for you to go to prototype, chemists, we agree that we are very poor at building stuff. If you have to build anything, and that's one of the challenging sensors also, you need engineers. So what I'm doing now is I'm taking in students from chemical engineering. I'm not thinking about the units that will be splitted, but I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking about my research. So I have, I have people from chemical engineering, two of my, I have two students now from chemical engineering working with me because Somehow, they understand how to design this. There was a time we went to one industry, Radical Waters, that designing for us. And as they were talking, my student became the champion. I became the fool. Because they were talking about many funny things about it. I just, I just looked at them and said, OK, fine. When you finish, I'm still the boss. <laughs> so, so, at the end of it, so that's what I'm trying to do here. And we are doing a lot of work in this area, trying to use different type of electrode for electrocoagulation. Yeah, this is the review. I'm so excited about this review. It took us one and a half years to write. One and a half years. I, I, it's just like saying the whole world, you better cite this document because it took us one and a half years to write. But it's out finally. It's a critical review in our area of research and it's published in a very excellent journal. Okay, some other things where we are going at the end of the day is my dream is to have our own plant that the industry can use to pre-treat their water 
either for discharge or for reuse. And we are also looking at desalination. I know this is not clear, but I put it there to show you that we already have a collaboration with the industry, Radical Waters. They designed this for us, so we are about to put to our first prototype in the laboratory. And I know Water Research Commission will be very, very happy to see that. What are the other things I do? I look at, um, I've worked with some other people, and I'm glad Dr. Malinga is in the house. Uh, our PhD work was in the area <coughs> of water treatment using membrane. So I came in again with my little expertise working with our Dendrima. So we're able to produce materials that can, we can use for dechlorination. And also recently, she came up with a brilliant idea of trying to solve the problem of membrane fouling. <coughs> In order to solve this problem, we now attach enzyme to the membrane surface. So while the membrane is doing the work, the enzyme is busy cleaning up the biofilms by catalysis. And we publish this work also, uh, I think it's this year. Okay? Other things I do uh, is developing hydrogels, smart material that can absorb dyes from water. And there was one we did that can swell and dissolve depending on the pH. So we've done a lot of work trying to absorb dye from water using hydrogel by Sorop. And also, um, this is one of um, my students of Lutando. We produce a lot of nanocarbons that can use to uptake metals uh, from water. Um, I'm almost done now. I have five more minutes. I'm shaking my time. So this is our research group, electrochemical research group. Uh, the university has been supporting this research group. And uh, this is just what we do in a nutshell. And like, okay, you know everybody here. Now, Dr. Kweli Yeju is no more a PhD student. He's now a postdoc working with me. Thank you, Dean, for giving go ahead. I know it's not customary for your student to stay with you after PhD, but I have to retain this guy because he knows too much. And I don't want him, I don't want him to go. Uh, I want him to train other people. So uh, this is our research group, and this is what we do. I would like to honor all my PhD students. Sorry, those of you who did masters, your picture is not here. Uh, when you become doctors, we'll put your pictures. So this, uh, I always believe in the first. This is my first PhD student. She's now a senior lecturer in University of Swaziland. This is my second, Dr. Malinga, she's there. And this is Dr. Bulewa and Sudrani, she's senior lecturer in UNISA. This is Dr. Sudish Chukla, she's a postdoc in Israel. Uh, this is Dr. Ama, she's a postdoc in CSIR. Dr. Sorov is somewhere in India. Uh, Dr. Peleyaju, he refused to go, he's with me. <coughs> Dr. S. Omukoro is uh, still around doing postdoc, but I know he's with Professor Priscilla, trying to do some work in energy, I guess. So, and uh, this is Ms. Tarisai Velempini. Well, I, I don't want to break protocol. She has completed her PhD, she has passed. We're just waiting for graduation. So, she's also a doctor in her own right. And uh, these are the master students I've supervised. I'm very happy to say out of these 12 students, I had 10 distinctions uh, so far for my masters. And it's, it's a very, very excellent group and good student that we have. And these are my current students, the current PhD. I will put your picture when you graduate. Uh, <laughs> Izzy, Idris, Lutando, Ben, Okalika, today, and these are my master's students. Uh, I think this year I have just very few master's students. And also, I would like to give credit to all the members of our group, both past and present. I can remember Katu, Sandile, Sam, and all of you that you are here. I really, really appreciate. I tried my best to look for pictures, and I sent it to the WhatsApp group for you to send me pictures of the group. But you did not send me, so I just put the ones that I could find. So if you don't look good, it's not my fault. <laughs> um, I just picked one, and uh, I like this vendor out. Is it vendor outfit or Corsa outfit? Corsa outfit, okay. Yeah, so it's multinational lab, multicultural lab. And these guys are the people from Radical Waters. They are excellent engineers. They can build anything. They came to our lab, so the relationship is ongoing, and we are developing our first reactor where we are able to treat water in multiliters. And conclusion and outlook. Uh, it has been a journey of grace and uh, with gratitude to God. I look forward to moving from success to significance. Uh, I can't unpack that in one hour, but it's very important to me. You are successful, so what? So what? And I know this is a philosophy that the dean also shares. Significance is impact. Now that you're a full professor, so what? And that is the question I'm 
answering and I hope to answer until I retire. I don't know what age I retire. I also look forward to contributing to the University of Johannesburg GES and with our new vice chancellor, you all know the fourth industrial revolution. And if you look at my talk, sensors and biosensors fit into the fourth industrial revolution because of automation. So I look into contributing into this area of research. And um, I also want to say something to the professors in the house, and maybe this talk will find itself into the media. I'm a passionate teacher, and it's very unfortunate that many of us nowadays do not want to teach. So I wrote it, if you read it there, that we complain about the postgraduate students that we have, that they are not well taught, they are not good breed. But the question is, we taught them in undergrad. So we are just reaping what we sold. So I just want to say, please, professors, let's go back to the class, especially undergraduate, especially first years. I love first years. And my HOG knows I love first years. That is the class I always, always want to teach. And by this saying this, I'm not asking for more workload. I'm just, uh, <laughs> I'm just, uh, I'm just expressing my passion here. And uh, well, let's finish with a quiz. The optimist sees the glass half full. The pessimist sees the glass half empty. How does a chemist see it? The answer is simple. To a chemist, it's a full glass. Half in the liquid state, half in the vapor state. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, Vice Chancellor, Professor T. Marua, the members of the University of Johannesburg Executive Committee, the Dean of the Faculty of Science, Professor Deborah Mayer, the Head of the Department of Applied Chemistry, Professor P. Govinder, other heads of the department, professors, Professor Priscilla Baker from the University of Western Cape, and other academic and non-academic staff of UJ and other universities here present, students of the University of Johannesburg, Prof. Arotiba's wife, Mrs. Adiola Abisola Arotiba, and Zion, Shalom, and Israel, the triumvirate of the Omotayo and Adiola Arotiba dynasty. Friends of the Friends of the Arotibas, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. May I start by thanking you, Jay, for inviting me to this prestigious event and according me the privilege of responding to this superb inaugural lecture of Professor Omotea Arotiba, Professor of Applied Chemistry, the University of Johannesburg. Ladies and gentlemen, the first baptism of Professor Arotiba into the South African culture was his attending of a sensor lab. Sensor lab is University of Western Cape Sensor Laboratories. So he attended a sensor lab Bry get together on a fairly cold morning of March 2006. That was barely a day or two after his arrival from Nigeria, having just wedded the previous weekend. Professor Rotiba could not stay to the end of the bri, which he didn't understand, which was a novel experience for a newlywed who was probably homesick and missing his dearly beloved and newly wedded wife. <laughs> as it turned out, within a couple of months, Tayo, as he was fondly known, established himself as a serious researcher right from his development and presentation of his doctoral research proposal to his quick grasp of the principles, techniques, and procedures of electrochemical science to its application in electrochemical sensor technology. It is important to note that most of the people who come to Sensor Lab never had any previous training in electrochemistry. So indeed, he was taxed with a cut, with um, 
a cutting edge PhD project of developing, as you have heard, a new generation of genosensors based on DNA recognition that was integrated to a metallodendritic electrochemical impedance spectroscopy signal transduction. His work demonstrated the elegant harnessing of the electroconductive efficiency of electroactive inorganic materials in the development of impedimetric genosensor that have impact in forensic science through DNA RNA fingerprinting, in medical diagnostic through disease biomarker determination at point of care, in environmental management through the determination of deleterious contaminants of air, water, and land, in food safety determination through the rapid detection of toxins, toxic heavy metals, microbial contaminants, and DNA RNA markers for genetically engineered products. You've heard most of it today, so I'm not going to repeat all that he has said. It is little wonder then that publications associated with Tayo's PhD work were listed among the Science Direct's top 25 hottest articles of October to December 2008. I refer you to Reactive and Functional Polymers 2008, volume 68, pages 1239 to 1244, and top Hottest articles of April to June 2009, published in Bioelectrochemistry in the year 2009, volume 75, starting from page 117. It is very remarkable that Professor Arotiba established himself as an exceptionally brilliant and independent researcher with high international recognition and one of the leading electrochemists in the country within a very short period in his career, the recognition of which precipitated in his being unanimously elected as the chairperson of the electrochemistry division of the South African Chemical Institute and a council member of the Chemical Institute in April 2018. In his lecture, captioned, sense it, treat it, electrochemistry in action, Professor Aretiba has demonstrated that the electrochemical device for sensing and signaling of chemical and biological contaminants that are inimical to healthy human lifestyle sustainability can also be developed into electrochemical reactors for ameliorative treatment of pollutants. He elaborated a lot on that. The worldwide impact of Professor Rotiba's contribution can easily be seen if we, for example, focus on just one aspect of his research work, the aspect of biosensors. The global market of biosensor devices was valued at 19 billion US dollars in 2017, and it is estimated that to reach 27 billion US dollars in 2022. This is driven by the technological innovations such as you've seen today in this presentation in the field of bioelectronics, nanotechnology, and microfabrication and the emergence of, as well as the continuous demand for point of care solutions based on biosensing technologies and the quest to significantly reduce monetary burden imposed on patients due to frequent clinical diagnostic tests. Suffice it, ladies and gentlemen, to say that the key players in the biosensor markets are not American companies. USA and Canada um, controlling 45% of the entire world market on biosensors, followed by Europe and Asia. The challenge for Africa is to develop strategies for harnessing the effort of frontline researchers, such as Professor Rotiba, in participating effectively in the biosensor market, particularly for disease diagnostics. Since Africa is the focus of some, is the current focus of some of the world's priority diseases, such as tuberculosis, HIV, malaria, and now Ebola. <laughs> Biosensors and bioelectronics have re has redefined the way the world of biomedical, food, forensic, and environmental analysis works. Through this research, through his research in, in 
next generation diagnostic biosensors combined with contaminant treatment and energy harnessing reactor technologies, Professor Rotiba is positioning UJ as an active participant in this area of research for the fourth industrial revolution, which is made more imperative by the emergence of drone-based sensors and Bluetooth app integration with biosensor and electrochemical reactor technology. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to join me in congratulating Professor Arotiba for his contribution and his impact in the world of electrochemistry and electrochemical, electrochemical technology and also the work he's doing at UJ. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Arutiba and Professor Emmanuel Iwoha. Have I pronounced it uh, correctly? <laughs> so now we have, uh, we have arrived at the moment in which we are supposed to, to call upon Professor Arutiba so that he can be uh, uh, given the piece of cloth that he actually deserves. <laughs> and I was told that we should move a little bit to this side. 